There's no one in town I know You gave us some place to go I never said thank you for that I thought I might get one more chance What would you think of me now? So lucky, so strong, so proud I never said thank you for that Now I never have a chance May angels lead you in Here you meet my friends On sleepless roads, the sleepless go May angels lead you in So you think of me now So lucky, so strong, so proud I never said thank you for that and Now I'll never have a chance May angels lead you in Here you meet my friends On sleepless roads And if you were with me tonight I'd sing to you just one more time A song for a heart so big God wouldn't let it live May angels lead you in Here you meet my friends On sleepless roads The sleepless go May angels lead you in May angels lead you in Here you be my friends On sleepless roads The sleepless go May angels lead you Good morning, everyone. I hope you're all here. I'll talk as loud as I can. To comply with local government regulations, you ask all to please wear their masks, with the exception of me, and uh, to sanitize your hands and exercise social distancing, please, because we've got a, a fair side of you here. Well, thank you very much for all of you who made the effort to be here uh, this morning. We're here because of the passing away of a dear friend, uh, Gary Carl Wersthausen. 
that he was born on the 1st of February, 1959. And he passed away on the 2nd of August, 2021. So that made him 62 years and 182 days old when he passed away. On the 30th of October, 1981, he made the altar. And uh, some eight and a half years later, I had, had a beautiful baby girl called Michelle. We made him Shannon Fulton on the 14th of October, 2017. So that gives a bit of background. Betty, therefore, is survived by Alter, his wife, his daughter, Michelle, his father and his mother, who are here today, Jack and Alice, Norma, his sister, Daryl, his brother, and of course, his extended family and friends on which some are here today. We, we thank you for making the time to be present at this uh, memorial <coughs> service for Gary. So he was a, a husband, he was a father, he was a son, he was a brother in law, and he had sisters in law. So Gary had a, quite a big family in him. As you've mentioned, your presence here today is testament to that. I met Gary in December of 1975 when his parents moved up from the Tell. And uh, Gary and I befriended each other and became quite good friends. So much so that we every morning had an arrangement at half past five to get in the car and go to the gym. So Gary and I trained at the gym. I wouldn't say it today, but quite fit those years. Uh, Gary and I were trained at the gym. He wasn't a man of many words, and sometimes you had to try and suss him out, try and understand where he was coming from. He said to me one day at the gym, he says, you know why you're going to the gym? Because you like my sister. Well, he wasn't the wrong to me, he said to me And shortly afterwards, uh, we'll get in altar and Norman and myself married in the same year. So, Alter and Gaddy would have been married 40 years this October. At this time, is a time for us to reflect on, on our loss. And we all need comfort at this time. I'm sure you'll appreciate that. If you're feeling grief, that's quite normal. Because death is an unnatural thing. The scriptures call death an enemy. And so to grieve is quite normal. If you go back into, into times, right from the beginning of time, faithful, strong men such as Abraham, the account tells us, began to grieve over his wife, Sarah. So the word began denotes that the grieving process took a period of time. Now, there's many other examples. One of note is the master Christ Jesus himself when he walked the earth, the perfect son of God. You will remember the account when uh, his dear friend Lazarus had died. And uh, he went to Lazarus's tomb and uh, they spoke to Martha, that was his sister. And we pick up the conversation here in the scriptures of John 11 and verse 25, which I'd like to share with you, you people this morning. John 11, verse 25. Just picture the scene. There's the master Christ Jesus with a lot of weeping people, grieved and seeing Lazarus was ill and he died. And in verse 25, Jesus says to Martha, I am the resurrection and the life. The one who exercises faith in me, even though he dies, will come to life. What did Jesus mean? He knew that he'd come to earth to give his life for mankind, to buy back what was lost. If you go to verse 35 of the same chapter, John 11, clearly says, Jesus 
gave way to tears. The perfect son of God felt the grief. Now, why did he give way to tears? He knew he could resurrect Lazarus. He knew he himself was going to die and be resurrected. Why would he grieve? Why would he give way to tears? He was pained at seeing the emotional trauma from his dear friends at the time of uh, Lazarus's passing. Now, Jesus Christ on earth said, you've seen me, you've seen the Father. So that means God also feels grief. Would you not agree? How does he feel when he sees an occasion like this of people grieving the loss of a, a dear friend and a family member? Well, the psalmist answers that question. They've got a Psalm 147, verse 3. Take note how God feels about those that are, are mourning and pain. Psalm 147, and verse 3. There the psalmist says, He heals the brokenhearted. He binds up their wounds. And so, like a wound, it will heal. There will be a scar, but the scar will always be there. And there's something we can't remove is a scar. Yet God takes note of the scars we bear from losing a loved one in death. And he's there for us when we're brokenhearted, such as this morning. But is that, is that the end of the matter? The Bible gives hope for the dead. The Bible shows us that God has four main attributes. Wisdom, justice, power, and his overriding quality is love. The scriptures tell us that God is love. So, what a God of love, how does he feel about death? Well, death was never part of his purpose. If we go right back to the beginning of time, and we can establish that fact. Because have a look at Genesis chapter 2. We go right back in time to the first human pair who were created perfect. Perfect health, perfect circumstances. If you look at Genesis 2 from verse 15, it says, Jehovah God took the man and settled him in the Garden of Eden to cultivate it and take care of it. So he was put there to look after this beautiful garden and extend the paradise to all ends of the earth and have children. No one has mentioned anything about him having to die. However, there was a command laid upon him to test his obedience. That command is given in verse 16, where God told him, from every tree of the garden you may eat to satisfaction. But as for the tree of knowledge of good and bad, you must not eat from it. For the day you eat from it, you will certainly die. Now this instruction would have seemed strange to Adam if he knew he was going to die anyway. But that wasn't the case. His obedience was what was meant to allow him to live forever on a beautiful earth. Sadly, he failed the test and sentence was pronounced on his actions. Record here at Genesis 3, <clears throat> verse 19. And God said to the first pair, In the sweat of your face you will eat bread until you return to the ground. For out of it you were taken, for dust you are, and to dust you will return. So Adam, by his disobedience, became sinful, and the, the result of sin is death, and because we are offspring of him, we inherited sin and death. There's nothing that we can do about it. You see, only God has the right to decide, to decide what is good and bad. But he creates humans like us with free choice to make decisions. The Apostle Paul at Romans 5 and verse 12 really summarizes the situation that we find ourselves in. In Romans chapter 5 and verse 12, where he says, That is why, just as through one man, Sin entered into the world, and death through sin. 
So death spread to all men because they're all sin. That is the word enter. So it meant that sin wasn't there before. It had a beginning. And that was through Adam. And of course, that spread to all of us here today. But does that mean there's no hope if one has died? What about the millions that have died in the past? Are they forgotten? Certainly not. Remember Jesus' earlier words we looked at? He said, I am the resurrection and the life. Those exercising faith in me will have everlasting life. So we go back to John chapter 5, verse 28. A marvelous hope, a marvelous future awaits all those that appreciate what God has done by means of his son, Christ Jesus. Look at John chapter 5 and verse 28. The master himself says, do not be amazed at this, for the hour is coming in which all, not some, all those in the memorial tombs will hear his voice and come out to a resurrection. It's interesting here, he speaks of the memorial tombs. So the memory plays a part here, if one is in a memorial tomb. But in whose memory of the millions and billions that have died over centuries and decades? They must be in God's memory. You might say, well, how is that possible that he could remember all these billions that have died? We'd like to illustrate it by uh, quoting a verse where it says that God knows the universe by name, the galaxies by name. And scientists have proved there are billions of galaxies. Now, in our Milky Way, there are millions and billions of stars. He knows them by name. Every single one of them. It's quite a thought, isn't it? So it's not difficult for God to recall in, from his memory any who have had given their lives have passed away. He knows their DNA. He knows their makeup. He knows their personality. So when he brings them back to life, he brings them back as perfect human being. No sickness and the like. It has been estimated that if you and I could name every star just in our Milky Way, one name per second, it would take you and I 12,000 years. God knows every star by name. He knows you. He knows me. And if we pass away, we go to his memory. What a safe place to be, isn't it so? To God's memory. And of course, Jesus also quoted the famous words, you know them well. From infancy, we were taught them. For God loved the world so much that he gave his only begotten son that those exercising faith in him might have everlasting life. So Jesus Christ, being a perfect man, came to earth to give his perfect life, the perfect life that Adam had lost by being disobedient. And of course, God did that to fulfill his own standard of justice. Is this not an unreal sort of a promise that we will see our loved ones back again? Is that not maybe a little bit far-fetched? Well, one thing's for sure, God cannot lie. It's impossible for God to lie. So if he makes a promise, he will always keep it. So that is confirmed by a well-known prophet by the name of Isaiah. In Isaiah chapter 55, verse 10 and 11, had this to say, confirms the reliability of his promise. Isaiah 55, 10 and 11. For just as the rain and the snow pour down from heaven and do not return there until they saturate the earth, making it produce and sprout, giving seed to the sower and bread to the eater, so my word that goes from my mouth will not return to me without results. It will certainly accomplish whatever is my delight and will have sure success in what I send it out to do. God cannot lie. He's promised the resurrection. Those that have died 
because the reason we die is that um, we have a damning sin. What a wonderful prospect awaits you and I, even those of us that are living. What a wonderful hope that we will see our loved ones again. But where will we see them? The psalmist in Psalm 37 had this interesting observation. Psalm 37 verse 11. But the meek will possess the earth and they will find exquisite delight in the abundance of peace. How different from today. Peace eludes mankind. The psalmist says there will be an abundance of peace on the earth. The meek will possess the earth. It is at a time like that that we look forward to seeing Gary and billions of others that God brings back from his memory and he allows his son to resurrect those that have died as a result of Adam's disobedience. But what will conditions be like on that new earth? Not like today. The earth's going to get cleaned up and if we look at scripture, there's no time to discuss it now. If we look at the signs, we're living in the last of the last days. God is soon going to take action to cleanse this earth and then begin his restoration process to bring back, amongst many things, those loved ones that have died back to life. But in vision, John recorded these words of Revelation 21 and verse 4. Can you see yourself in conditions described here? Revelation 21 verse 4. And you will wipe out every tear from their eyes and death will be no more. Neither will mourning, nor outcry, nor pain be anymore. The former things have passed away. This must be referring to conditions on the earth, for there is no death or mourning or pain in the heavens. Can you imagine living on an earth where there's no more death, no more sickness, no more mourning, no more tears as a result of losing a loved one in death? Do you look forward to a time like that? Do we not? Do we have a guarantee? Why, yes, we do. The scriptures confirm that Jesus' own resurrection is a guarantee of what God will do on a far larger scale. 1 Corinthians 15, and verse 20, the first part of verse 20 has this to say, but now the Christ has been raised from the dead, and there were hundreds that witnessed that. Hundreds. He raised from the dead to present the value of his perfect human life to his father to buy back the human race, which includes you and I. Verse 20 and 21 of 1 Corinthians 15, 21 and 22. For since death came through a man, resurrection of the dead also comes through a man. For just as in Adam all are dying, so in the Christ, all will be made alive. Our exercising faith in that promise shows our appreciation for what Jesus did for us, giving up his life for us. Well, at this time, you may also wonder, what is the condition of the dead? What happens when we die? Well, God doesn't leave us to guess. He tells us in his word, what is the condition of the dead? That a wise man named Solomon, one of the wealthiest men that ever lived, penned these words at Ecclesiastes 9 and verse first part of verse 5 and 10. For the living know that they will die, but the dead know nothing at all. It is like being in a deep sleep, total unconsciousness. Nothing to remember, nothing to do. And that's what verse 10 says. Whatever your hand finds to do, do with all your might, for there's no work, no planning, no knowledge, no wisdom in the grave where you are going. Our beloved friend Gary lies sleeping safely in God's memory. In God's given time, he will bring back all those that have died, including yours and mine. Love, dear ones, friends, and family. Well, how do we benefit from being here 
this morning. And we thank you for coming. But how do we benefit from being here? Ecclesiastes 7, verse 1 and 2 says, A good name is better than good oil, and the day of death is better than the day of birth. So what kind of a name do you and I have? You know, when we're born as babies, we're in a crib, we didn't even have our own name. Our parents or someone else named us. But as you get into life and you live out your life, you start establishing a reputation for yourself. And it's that name. When you attach a name to your reputation, you define yourself as to who you are. And then verse 2 says, Better to go to the house of mourning than to the house of feasting. For that is the end of every man, and the living should take it to heart. Our being here today should help us to think and appreciate what are we doing with our life right now. Time and unforeseen occurrence can befall each one very quickly. We like a mist. We don't even know where we are tomorrow. So what kind of a name am I making right now, particularly with my Creator? Jesus went on earth said, store for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither rust nor moth can consume. And so that's what we want to do. Constant on making a good name with God. At this time too, Alter and Michelle would certainly appreciate your comfort and your support. I think you being here today um, certainly shows them that you care for them, and I think they very much appreciate that. That concludes our memorial service. We're just going to show, say a short prayer, and there's a few thank yous. Alter has asked us to give, and then uh, we'll hand over to Daddy's brother Daryl just to introduce those that are going to say a few words. We're just going to say a short prayer. Our Father in the heavens, Jehovah, Sovereign Lord of the universe, we thank you so much for the wonderful hope you've given us. You care for us, you love us as individuals, and the times we go through now are abnormal, Father. We know that you feel the pain with us, but we pray, please, that you may comfort and strengthen the family and help us to do so too. We thank you for your Son, Christ Jesus, who laid down his life for us so that we could have everlasting life in the near future. We look so forward to that time. In the meantime, please be with us, help us, strengthen us and comfort us for what lies ahead. We offer this prayer of thanks in Christ Jesus' name. Amen. Mm -hmm. Alter asked uh, just to thank a few people and obviously thank all of you for being here, which we appreciate. Uh, special thanks uh, to Michelle, our daughter. Now, I, I don't know Michelle that well like I should have. For the last month, I've seen a very, very strong young lady who has supported her mother. You're a pillar. I'm telling you to do that. Also to Yuna, Tracy, Susan and Martin, and all the messages and flowers and visits that uh, everybody sent to Alta. Doesn't end here. She's going to need those calls and those visits and even going forward. So we want to make sure she has them. Thanks to, to uh, EP Digital, Jacques and Emmanuel, Warren, for setting it up, and the Hammond family. I think that uh, just about covers it. So we're going to ask Daryl just to uh, come forward and introduce uh, some of the like to you. Thank you. Firstly, thank you, Raymond, for those wonderful thoughts and that uh, showing us how wonderful uh, we have a the future and the, and the possibility of seeing our brother and our family and friends again. Um, we have a, a gentleman by the name of Mike from Insulet. We'd like to just say a few words. Mike, would you please come across for us, please? Mind my last help. Okay, I had to write a speech. It's not like when Gary and I are normal. When we have a few drinks, we just talk. We continue talking non-stop after you know. Now this occasion I have to prepare something to say something like 
I know we'll see that more through service. Firstly, I'd like to thank everyone for being here today to honor our dear friend Gary, a super dad to Michelle, and a dear husband to Elsa. And now Gary is our guardian angel watching all over us. Though I am still reeling from the sudden death of my dear friend Gary, I am humbled and touched by his time here with us. Excuse the pun, really, as you can see, Gary loved the ocean and fishing. For those of you who don't know me, I'm Gary worked for Lake since 1992. My, we've become friends since then until now. Our friendship only grew stronger and stronger. I'll never forget our road trip to Nelspray, Durban, Botswana, and all over the country. And mind you, all the work, work trips. But, and then Gary, he worked absolutely hard. He dedicated his life to his work. But then on the other hand, when he played, he played harder than work. All those who know him should know that. Michelle, you are your dad's life. He always spoke about you. He was so proud of you. That's how you were Gary's brother. He referred to you as mommy and always said, mommy will take care of him. He loved you very dearly. And I'm saying all these words because Gary spoke about his love for you and Michelle. And he threw out his emotions when we had a few drinks then we let his personal um, feelings out. Because Gary wasn't this person who spoke all the time. He was more dedicated to his work, he'll work. When it comes to a business as well, he'll get to his laptop, he'll get to the panels of this work. He, he, does, he doesn't talk. So every now and then he get a chance and then and he builds up all his emotions. For all of us, you know, Gary, you'll know that Gary's life was dedicated to Stevens. He's one of the best, or shall I say, smartest engineers that I knew. He will be, he'll be really missed by the engineering fraternity. Gary assisted and found solutions for everyone Whoever needed technical or any engineering difficulties, he was there to assist them. He dedicated his time, weekends, nights, any time of day, holidays. If anybody called him, Gary never refused. He picked up the phone and tried to help him telephonically, or you'll go to site and you'll then you will sort out the problems. He traveled across Africa commissioning and engineering work. He never refused anyone who needed help at any time of day or night. He was such a humble and respectful. He will be sadly missed by all of us. <laughs> Gary is gone from sight, but he'll never be from our hearts. He'll be removed forever. And I think everybody here will know Gary and they will never ever forget him. Thank you. Thank you so much, Carla, for those wonderful words and just bringing out that personality of my brother. I know Gary, Gary was like that. He was a very quiet person. He hardly ever said anything, but he just got down there, he did the job. And then he made wonderful friends. He was a wonderful, heartfelt person. He had a beautiful heart. And that is so true that he was like that. And uh, that's how old I know my brother. You know, you, you find him and you ask him, Gary, you know, what do you do? What job do you do? He says, sorry, you, you know, I'm trying to explain it, but I don't think you understand it. Let's say that we've got a mother and brother the ability to. But the complexity of that was was so so um, above me, I'm sure. And the hard worker that he was, forever traveling all over the place, um, and doing his best for his family. And as mentioned, Alta and Michelle were his everything. Okay, I'd like to hand over now to Mark uh, Marco from Siemens, the director of Siemens. And Marco, if you come through and just say a few words for us, we'd appreciate that as well. Thank you so much. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. And let me first say thank you for the honor that I can say a few words for Siemens. Secondly, I'm sending all the condolences you know, from the colleagues, from our management, uh, from our executive management, and Sabine. I apologize herself for being here personally today. Yeah, what to say about Gary from, from our side? Um, Ma'am Mike did a lot of the points already. You know? He lost within our company, he lost Gary twice. He went into his well-deserved retirement, uh, unlikely shortly before this, this bad things happened. And then you know, beginning of August, uh, when Alta gave us the or gave me the information what's happening in these hard times, it was you know, shocking for the whole, for the whole colleagues, the whole team you know, to, to get these bad news then in August. 
Gary was a dedicated worker, dedicated engineer. He did everything for the company. Sometimes he spent even too much time for the company, let's say it like that. Yeah, his work was his life, besides his two biggest pillars, his daughter and his wife. And Gary was a mentor, a colleague, a very good friend to a lot of the people in Siemens. Um, he was a mentor to everybody with his amazing knowledge. Yeah? He was a quiet and relaxed person. Uh, when every blood pressure was on 180, Gary was still calm. Gary solved the problem, didn't matter what happened. Yeah? As Mike said, yeah? you call Gary on a Saturday, on a Sunday, yeah? morning at six, in the evenings at eight, you always would have got a relaxed and friendly person, you would have get an answer for you. Gary was dedicated to his work, so even when his, his car was on the way to Zimbabwe without him, he still went on with the customer uh, before he did all the rest to get his car back at that time. And that just showed, happened shortly before. And he was well known, he had an amazing reputation for all our customers. Uh, if, if they wanted to, if they had a bigger problem, yeah, there was always one name, it was Gary. So with deep sadness on the stage today, uh, we wish all the strength to the family. All the thanks to you, Michelle. You did what I saw the last month. He would be proud of you. He will be proud of you for what you did, what you did to your mother. And we will meet him again. He's now sailing his seven seas. The captain is on his way. So all the strength. Thank you. Thank you so much, um, Colin. Uh, sorry, sorry, Colin. <laughs> um, for those words as well. And I know that Gary uh, gave his life to his work. Um, I know he was always busy, he was always busy working. And Siemens was his life. As long as I know or I can remember, he's always worked for Siemens. He had a so short period of time when he was working for SA and he did his, he did his apprenticeship. But from there, it's been Siemens all the way. And um, there's a, there was a point where he was going to go on pension, and that was sort of put behind. And he, now he was, you know, he's going to be going on pension as well. So all his life was given to Siemens, and he was happy there. You know, he wouldn't have stayed there for so long if he wasn't. And that's why he worked so hard. He was a very hard worker, and I'm sure he um, really appreciates your words. Now, I would love to uh, ask Michelle. Michelle's asked to say a few words. And Michelle, you are your father's pillar. You're always your father's pillar, your close, your dad's closest, his little puppet. And he loved you with, with all his heart. And um, so please uh, come, come uh, he's got to stand and please uh, say a few words yeah. for us, uh, for your father. Thanks, Michelle. How does one begin to explain or even put in words how amazing a man was in such a short period of time? Or even come to terms with the fact that when we speak about him, it is now in past tense. Truth is for me, there is no words, no time in the world for me to express how much my dad meant to me or how amazing he was for that matter of fact, or is. Those who knew my dad and I would know that he, well, we were so alike. Some would even say carbon copies. And it's true from our soft hearts, sensitivity, and not to mention our dyslexia, which I have seen more in myself the past couple of days, might I add. So our love for the ocean and the fact that I was his absolute world and a true daddy's little girl through and through. Even at the age of 31, he would tell me, you are still my little girl with tears in his eyes, which most of you know, he was not afraid to show his emotions especially when it came to his wife and daughter. I used to get so embarrassed when he told me that, but I would give anything to have him say that to me again. I was his absolute, my dad never ever got cross or mad at anyone or anything. However, when my dad got cross, you knew about it. And boy, oh boy, if you ever spoke German, you knew. You had to leave because you were in the, he was in the, he was in the hallway. He was in the hallway. 
And not many people ever saw that side of him unless he wanted you to. Now the shakes. One thing I can say about my dad is that his love for his wife, mommy, I love you lots. And you look absolutely beautiful. And daddy would have loved what you look like today. Daddy, she looks beautiful. Was just as deep and unconditional as his love for me. The love was something special, so raw and pure. The love you can only find in novels. And I can say I truly have with my hubby, Shannon. I love you lots. On the 31st of next month, they would, they would be married for 40 years, and I totally admire that. As many of you know, my dad was the captain of his own ship. His love for the ocean was something else. Whenever he was at the ocean, his face would light up, and he would smile as if the ocean was talking to him. My dad and I shared this love for the ocean. It was like nothing could go wrong, and it gave us the sense of calm and relaxation. What my dad used to enjoy the most of the ocean was deep sea fishing, or fishing in general. And every holiday we went to, Margate, Chili Beach, he would go out and fish. He would always catch something. And when he caught, and when he got back, the smile on his face was so infectious. And he was always excited to show and tell my mom and I what he had caught and how to fight off the sharks to get it. The way he told these stories about his fishing, is, it's as if you were there with him. Now you must understand my dad was good at fishing and not always lucky. The one year, I will never forget it, we went to Margate, stayed at my Aunt Norma and Uncle Raymond's place, holiday home, just off the coast. We had a door that entered the ocean. There was a, there was a little, what I think they call a lagoon, just outside the gate. He decided he was gonna do a little fishing. He caught a good sized, decent sized fish and decided he was gonna cook it for us. Wanted to come up to the house, but he had forgotten the keys in the unit. And it was one of those auto lock doors the minute you closed it, you couldn't get back in. So he walked around to the front of the house. My mom and I were chilling in the sunroom where we could actually see him from the top fishing. He got his keys and went back down. He had left his fish his, that he caught in a grocery bag and his rod, etc., or the tackle down at the bottom by the gate. Little did he know when he arrived to collect his goodies, the wild cats in the bushes had smelt it, and they decided to help themselves and ate the fish. <laughs> a normal person would be very, would be highly ticked off and cross and upset. Not my dad. He came up to tell my mom and I the story, but the way he was telling it, he was smiling the whole way through, saying to us, and I quote, you won't believe it, but the cat stole my fish. The little buggers. My mom and I were in stitches. My dad was not just a dad to me, but he was a dad, a son, a brother, a colleague, and a dear friend to many here today. He was kind, generous, sometimes too much. A man of honor, strength, selfless in many ways. He never expected anything in return. He was my hero, my pillar of strength. Going through life without him for my mom and I is going to be challenging. A challenge we didn't think we would need to be ready for. I vow to you, Daddy, from this day forward, my captain, my anchor. I promise to live my life for you with pure emotion, joy, and generosity. I honor you and honor to ensure your legacy lives on through me and to be able to look up to you from above for guidance. My uncle Ray spoke about the constellations and how there are so many. Mommy, um, if you would like to come up here, please. I've got a gift for you. This is for you and I to know that daddy will always be with us. And whenever you feel the need for some strength or guidance, you can look up. This is a star. Daddy is now still in the gift. Every time you need some guidance or strength, Daddy is up above. Okay. And you will go after us. Thank 
closing, I would like to play a little clip that was shared in passing that helped help give me a bit of strength through this time of grieving, as well as for death as a whole. It's called If Tomorrow Starts Without Me by David Romano. I want to make sure it's connected with the speaker. But tomorrow starts without me by David Romano. Possibly. When tomorrow starts without me, and I'm not there to see. If the sun should rise and find your eyes all filled with tears for me. I wish so much you wouldn't cry the way you did today while thinking of the many things we didn't get to say. I know how much you love me as much as I love you. And each time that you think of me, I know you'll miss me too. But when tomorrow starts without me, please try to understand that an angel came and called my name and took me by the hand. And said my place was ready in heaven for me, and that I'd have to leave behind all those I dearly love. But as I turned to walk away, a tear fell from my eye. For all my life I'd always thought I didn't want to die. I had so much to live for, so much left yet to do. It seemed almost impossible that I was leaving you. I thought of all the yesterdays, the good ones and the bad. I thought of all the love we shared and all the fun we had. If I could relive yesterday, just even for a while, I'd say goodbye and kiss you and maybe see you smile. But then I fully realized that this could never be. For emptiness and memories would take the place of me. And when I thought of all the things I might miss come tomorrow, I thought of you. And when I did, my heart was filled with sorrow. But when I walked through heaven's gates, I felt so much at home. When God looked down and smiled at me from his great golden throne, he said, this is eternity, and all I promised you. Today, your life on earth is past, but here, life starts anew. I promise no tomorrow, but today, the world is lost, and since each day is the same, there's no longing for the past. You have been so faithful. So trusting and so true. And there were times you did some things you knew you shouldn't do. But you have been forgiven and now at last you're free. So won't you come and take my hand and share my life with me? So when tomorrow starts without me, don't think we're far apart. For every time you think of me, I'm right here in your heart. Thank you. I actually forgot to mention thank you so much to my Uncle Raymond. My mom and I would not have been with, we would also be lost without your guidance and my Auntie Norma for arranging all of this today. It's beautiful and thank you so, so much. We took one for the team and uh, I really and truly appreciate it and I love you guys both. Thank you so much. And now we celebrate the life of my father. Oh, I think Shane's good.
Thank you, Ms. Oliver. That's a wonderful words for you, for your father, and I wouldn't put a spot of voice. Um, it's really heartbreaking for me as well. But um, I didn't know my brother all that well because I was the baby in the family. Uh, 10 years younger, so I was always a little guy running around getting on his nerves. But as we grew, grew older, I connected with him. And he was a, a wonderful man, and I loved spending the time together when we had, when we had different the opportunities to do so. He subsequently moved to Cape Town, so we hadn't seen him for, for a very much, not for a very long time, but we've always been keeping in contact, and believe me, also. We just a phone call away, a WhatsApp away. I'm with you, with you in my heart. And Michelle, thank you so much to my niece, to the wonderful girl, woman. And um, thank you for your words. And remember that I'm here for you as well. And you and your mom for a wonderful team together. And you'll name John. Okay. Um, Okay, so those are the proceedings for today. Uh, what we're going to be doing is we're going to be having team snacks outside. Um, so we're just going to set up on that side if you just give us a little while, and we can all go outside and just spend some time together as well. Thanks. <laughs> sorry. Um, sorry, just a moment. The, if anybody needs to use the restrooms, the ladies' restrooms are basically just behind me there, so just around the corner. And the gents, if you go down, if you go around, Jay, you'll see there's a gate. It's basically in that building over there. And it says uh, tech, tech room, okay? So there, there's a gents in that, in that area, but the ladies are just behind us. I'm going to sign it to you now. I just want to say bye to everyone on here. Love you, Michelle. Hi, hi. So I'm sign it to you now. I just want to thank you. For making us part of this from Australia, especially to the mom. So, thinking of you. Okay, then the screen further off. Show me you go. No, no, yeah, I'm just saying thank you to everyone and Hi. Thank you, Michelle, and goodbye from Germany. Thanks a lot for making us part of the session. Thanks, Michelle and Elta. Uh, it's Warner here from Australia. Uh, it was a wonderful service. Um, my condolences and best wishes going forward. Bye. Thank you, everyone, for joining the Zoom chat. You're more than welcome to log off if you wish to. That concludes our memorial service for my dad.
Thank you so much for attending. Michelle.